very manipulative. I suffer with glib, you know, words come easily, but it's insincere. Um, I've got psychopathic tendencies. You know, all these kind of what I believe was a misrepresent a misrepresentation of who I am. As I'm not understanding what he's just said. Life with a recommendation of seven. I'm just thinking, yeah, seven. I'll be 27. I'm still gonna do. I'm gonna get my man back. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna. You know, I'm making. I'm making superficial plans, not understanding the magnitude of what I, of what the actual judge is actually giving me. The discretionary life sentence. I didn't understand that until when it was broken, broken down to me. Then I said, "All oh, gloves are off." You go somewhere silent, and you. You tend to deal with that, whether that's in the showers, whether you go to somebody's cell and you resolve it. I had lots of um, hand to hand combat with many individuals because, obviously, especially knowing how I am as well, I couldn't believe it. There was intel that I was um, planning to cause an atrocity in the streets of Britain. This is where we do our Friday during our, during our prayers. So we're going to do it. And he says, Why were you going to do That was it. That's red flags. So. Unfortunately, I, um, I injured him very badly. Please, members of the public as well, if anyone can help as well, I'm trying to make changes here. I made a promise to a lot of a lot of these brothers as well that I'll be a voice for them. I understand that you might have a perception about how certain prisons, but it's not the case. I can honestly put my hand on my heart and say, if you give an opportunity to a lot of these individuals as well, you actually see the benefits that they can actually provide for society. end up probably going to 10 or 12 different places yeah, you literally get moved. Kept on moving. Were you um I've heard of um someone I interviewed before who was a problem in the system they did something similar where they were going from block to block but they didn't know when they were getting moved. I okay. remember what it's called it was like ghost train or something like this they called it was mine that when you were on? No mine will come later on. So was it were you getting moved from block to block or were you getting put onto wings at all? Wings. You actually get wings, put onto wings and, and then, then and then back to the block. And were you and then from the block you sometimes get shipped out to another prison and so forth, but the block to block will come later on. In so you're on madness at these times then. So you're literally lasting on the wings for a couple of weeks at a time then. Um, yeah, sometimes even shorter than that. I could be for a few days. I'll see the whole dynamics, and especially that I had so many friends and so forth. So even if they were in the situation as well, I said, "Man, don't go. You sit back, relax. I will deal with it." So it was. So like you said, obviously for you, it's. When you've lost hope, it doesn't mean anything to you either way. It doesn't matter. It is what it is then at those times there. 100, 101%. And this was all prior to you even being sentenced. And then to talk about the actual sentencing, day of sentencing, obviously, um, you were hoping for something a lot less than what you got. You were hoping for sort of a 10 year sentence, maybe get out of the five. And um, to talk to me about the day and what, what happened and the feeling. I'm not going to lie to you as well. I can't remember. So many things have happened in my life as well that. That is just like a distant memory to me. But what I can remember was when I got sentenced, I still I still couldn't understand it because everything was going fast for me. It was like, okay, um, life to serve seven. So I'm thinking, yeah, seven. I'm not understanding what he's just said. Life with a recommendation of seven. I'm just thinking, yeah, seven. So I'll be twenty seven. I'm still gonna do I'm gonna get my man back, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna you know, I'm making I'm making superficial plans, not understanding the magnitude of what I, of what the actual judge is actually giving me, the discretionary life sentence. I didn't understand that until when it was broken broken down to me, then I said, all oh, gloves are off. And that's when I totally just lost the plot in the sense of just anything to irritate the system. I just basically done. I didn't care. Even 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 those that were doing negative things in the system were telling me to slow down. It was just like, come on, kid. Do you understand? Like, look what you're doing. 
Sorted. But like I said, um, previously obviously leading to the remand, you had lost hope. And then when you get something like that, mm. it, that any even grain of hope is completely gone. And 100%. you're a 20-year-old man who's just been given a life sentence. Mm. I, became, to, I became 21 then. 21. But it's hard to comprehend or even see an end date or even seeing getting through it. And it's just impossible. Um, and so, obviously, like you said, you've ended up going um, even more the other way and rebelling against the system, um, unfortunately, but I guess expectedly at the same time. Um, did you get um, put in Cat A or Cat B, was it? And did you get put into the dispersal system as well then at that point? So what actually happened, I can recall, so sorry, some of it is hazy, but I remember that once I actually got convicted, in Scrubs, there was a life wing. It was actually D-Wing. And so what they decided to do was to put me on the life wing. In D-Wing. So I was there for a while. When I say a while, maybe, a, a, you know, a couple of, a few months. And it was, it was quite relaxed at that time because they allowed you to do your, you know, your boxing, your sparring, your mittens. And these are the things... These are the things that I loved. And at the time, um, Tony Crabb was alive. And he was, you know, from a traveler community. He was also a trainer and doing that. So he was just sharpening my tools that I already knew anyway. So I would always practice with him three or four times a week. Then there was an actual officer. His name was Mr. Jarvis. And he would actually take me to the gym with him and would spar. Yeah. I have to give it to him. Do you find some He's, good ones in amongst he the was, He was, yeah, he was a tough guy. There's no stereotypes. You can't, you know, men are men irrespectively no matter what their occupation are there's tough men in all different fields and so forth and we would spar we would spar we would train and so forth but then an incident occurred and then after that all the gloves the pads everything was taken and you know i apologize i apologize to the guys as well because obviously because of my actions resulted in everything being taken away but there was a gym officer just just couldn't see eye to eye and he seized upon the opportunity to prevent me from going to the gym because I forgot my card. So I said, look, just one second. And he said, no, you can't, too late. And then it just irritated me because we had bad blood already between us. He just didn't like me. He just saw me as a, I don't know, I think he saw me as a mouthy kid. Like, I know that there was a rumor once. He looked at me because at that time I was still kind of slim. And he says, what, him? So it seems like he had something. Somebody told me that, like, oh, what him? He must have been saying that, yeah, that kid can. So I was just, and me being me, and at that particular moment in time as well, I think um, I wanted something to occur at that time. Because of that comment, it upset me so much. So I think when this opportunity, uh, you know, arise for him especially and for me, and it was a bad combination, and so we got into an argument. Um, again, he came. Uh, he came into close proximity to me, invading my personal space. And then, um, unfortunately, he was disconnected. And mm. then, the, you know, I'm thankful for the guys that were there as well that they held me back, so I didn't get further charges and things such as this, but. And then they said, look, we can't, we can't handle. So they talked to the, um, they talked to the SEG, obviously. It's a massive incident. But there was a, there was a governor at the time. Her name was Miss Actor. She, she had faith in rehabilitation and so forth. And she wishes to say that you hide behind this kind of mask of being a tough guy, but look, really and truly, you are a caring and gentle person. She'd always used to say that. And she would say that, I'm going to help you. And so <clears throat> I was I was there and then what they done was they they arranged for me to from the seg for me to go education. Yeah, I met a lady named Angel. She was the head of the education department. And then that's when uh you could actually say my my road to redemption started slightly. And this was in so what uh, this was roughly in 2000 uh, 2003 
Mm. So when I say road to redemption, I'm talking about like loving books again, reading, educating. Because remember, I haven't been to school since the age of 12. So what the teacher actually said, she identified, she said, you're highly intelligent. And she said, I've noticed that you've become accustomed of using slangs. And she said, that's not a problem. She said, when you're conversing with your peers, but in a professional setting as well, you need to know how to conduct yourself properly. So what she actually done was as well, she um, allowed me to have a dictionary and to learn new words. So every time I, <laughs> every time we, we met each other, I had to learn a word and what the meaning was. And then we'll do that and then she helped me to do presentations and things such as that. So I was more confident in talking and how I conduct myself and how I articulate myself and how I saw things. Fair play to us, definitely worked with um, your vocabulary now today. Um, so Always fair play okay. to that. Oh, thank you very much. But um, how long did you end up um, sp spending down the block in that, at that time there? Um, to be fair, I think it was, if my memory can um, serve me correctly, so after that incident, I think I spent about maybe six weeks before another incident happened where that I had to go. You had to? I had to, I had to go, basically, they had to get rid of me. So what happened was that, um, I think it was the backlash of the incident, because remember, they're already upset that one of their own, but because of, I think it was 50-50, because a lot of officers didn't like that gym officer, a lot of them were actually deep down happy that yeah. it happened to him. He was kind of a bully, I would let to believe, amongst his own staff. So some were glad and some weren't. And the incident happened on the visit, where um, I clashed with another officer, which I found out was a friend of his. And um, unfortunately, he was injured as well. And then from from there, that's when they laid into me. Fucking hell, yeah, I bet they laid into you badly as well. Um, um, not really, because remember I told you about the officer that I used to train with. Yeah. He used to take me down to the gym. Jarvis. Yes. He kind of, I think he kind of prevented that. So, so okay, you're lucky I still, you I still, I still got some. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, they punched me in my face. But that, for me, that was a standard. I, I understood what comes with it. So, you know, like, punching you in the ribs, kicking you, and, you know, things like that. But not to the extent that I knew what would have happened if it weren't for his interventions. Mm. And so where did you end up? Did you end up getting moved then from there, then, did you? Yeah, so um, I went to Swellside. And was that block to block? You went straight into block? Um, I'm trying to recall. No, actually, funny enough, I was supposed to. I left there, I went to Swellside, and then I think it was a CO at the time, custodial manager. They actually, we said, P, it was a PO by recently. He, he actually came, he actually came down reception and actually spoke to me and said, that, look, are you going to behave? We can put you on the wing. Yeah, gave you a chance. Yeah, so they all that. So I'm thinking, of course, I don't I he said, oh, you know, swell side is, is not an easy place. Um, are you going to behave? I said, of course. I was just happy. I want to be on the wing. So I don't know what wing I went on first. I have a C or D. This, this was um, what was held for the lifers. Yeah. And then by then, obviously, I met old friends. And things were, things were, um, things were actually the first time around when I went to Swellside. Because I've been to Swellside about three times. Yeah. The first, the first, the first time it was okay. Then I received a um, letter through my door stating that would I like to go to um, Dovegate Therapeutic Community? Yeah. And I realised that it was let's go back to when I was in um, Wormwood Scrubs. That governor, Miss Actor, she actually got in contact with what I found out with Dovegate Therapeutic Community and suggested that they try to help me. So I signed the forms. And I signed the forms and then eventually they came on. I went there. It was a whole culture. It was a therapeutic community. It's a whole culture shock. I think we was at odds as well because at the time as well, their philosophy was that we knock you down and build you back up again. Mm -hmm. So for me, it just didn't feel right. It felt like, okay, so you're trying to mold me into your image which I'm not going to be moulding into anybody's image. I am me. 
who I am. If you want to help me, we can. So I felt that there was already a kind of conflict of interest to a certain degree. What actually, and then the story of my life again, then one day an incident happened with me and the officer. He was, he was, a, he was the operations manager. So I'm a Muslim. Had you and become a Muslim at that time? No, it's, yeah. we have to go back for the first time when I went into Felton at 16. That's when I embraced Islam. Okay. It was through a friend of mine as well. He didn't really know a lot about his faith, but what he said made sense. And going back to my life of like religion and so forth, I was always inquisitive. And Islam for me made a lot of sense. So I embraced it then. But the thing was as well, I never really, some people say that, well, so what happened then? If that actually brought you some type of enlightenment, then why are you behaving the way that you behaved? First and foremost, is as human beings, none of us are perfect. We, we, we're going to continuously make mistakes. Secondly, as well, it was a bit different in those times as well, because what I found was socially, different e um, ethnicities stuck with their own. So it was kind of different, and especially as me being Afro-Caribbean, we were kind of like just pushed to the side. It weren't really that kind of community feel. So it was a bit different compared to now, yeah. where that there is a greater understanding as people that wanted to. So obviously, I just went back into all patterns of behavior. I didn't learn how to pray until I was about 23. So all, the, all that time, I didn't know how to pray, but I just believed what I believed, and I took my shahad, and I was happy with this. And so at that point there, that must have been a real turning moment in your life then, at 23. I know you said you sort of, sort of got into it slightly at 16, but at 23, mm. um, when you fully embraced your faith. I did, but it was still, obviously, we're talking about, I always use this concept as well. Let's say that, You've been sleeping for eight hours in a dark room and then somebody puts the light on. At first, your your eyes are, it's going to take a while for your eyes to adjust to the light. And it's exactly the same. How many years of darkness have I been? Look at my situation, look at my mentality, my mindset. So I was, I was still in that kind of conflicting stages. And so what triggered me with this gentleman as well is that this his blasé and cavalier approach to what I was actually saying to him. So when I um they said this to us that we're gonna do where we pray in that room, prayers, Friday prayers, he said, No, uh, we're having a meeting. I said, But you can't though. I said that the governor has actually said that this is where we do our Friday Juma Juma prayers. So we're gonna do it. And he says, Why were you gonna do? That was it. That's red flags. So, unfortunately, I um I injured him very badly. Mm. Um, it was that bad that residents actually held me, and I'm so thankful to them. Um, the police were called, everything else, but before that, but they dropped the case because what actually happened to me, I actually, I actually got, I actually got beaten as well. So. They took me to the they took me to the seg in the adjudication room whilst I'm talking to the governor, they all ran in, slayed into me. I understood it. Of course. But um I think then they lost their case. Because of, Because uh, now yeah, we're you gonna explain. I'm going to what I'm going to see the police with a black eye, I'm going to see the it's not gonna So it seems like most of your problems up until this point that or that point, mm -hmm. it was always the authority figures you had the problems with rather than the other inmates and such. Is that true? Do you have no, because um in our times as well, residents dealt with it. It was it was weird. It was like a gladiatorial contest. So you're not gonna do it in front of officers. People would consider you to be a coward. Actually. Like imagine if I'm arguing with you now and the officers then I, I swing a punch at you as well. Then people are gonna say, Oh you were scared. He was just doing this for them. You go somewhere you go somewhere silent and you you tend to deal with that, whether that's in the showers, whether you go into somebody's cell and you resolve it as what we considered at the time as being men. Yeah. 
So that's that's it. I had a lot. I had lots of um, hand to hand combat with many individuals because obviously, especially knowing how I am as well, I'm very sensitive. And you know, there was a lot of other guys as well that are also the same way inclined. So obviously, you're bound to clash. Yeah, no, I understand. And so after this beating, then you down to the block again, then in segregation. Yeah. And how long did you end up spending down there this time? Then, and then I think it was. Then? I think it was about five weeks until then. Eventually, I was, I was sent to dispersals. Now I'm going dispersals. So that's where the ball game changes. And in terms of the block time, quick before dispersal, being in segregation, like how did you cope with it? Um, for me, I spent seven days in the block in my life, which I know is a joke compared to you spent seven years. Mm. But I found that difficult in itself. And I'm one of these people that I, I'm a bit of a loner character, so I thought I'd be a be easy in the block and it wouldn't be a thing but when you literally don't talk to anyone and don't have anyone to bounce ideas off even to speak to for days and days and days at a time it can really affect you I found how did you find it um, I don't know it's weird for me it kind of um, in those stages see there's two stages when we get to the, the point where that I was at CSC and I've done seven years of social confinement it had a different effect compared to the effect that it was having when I was going to the seg every few days or whatever, and spending weeks on um, good order and discipline, GOAD. Mm. Um, I think it just increased my anger. Like oh, I, I read, mm. and I was just angry. So they, so yeah, they did win in a certain way because they psychologically they damaged me in the sense of I was just angry. Of course, it doesn't help. Like even seven days, the pale seven days I went down, I was ready to fight as soon as they come out of there. So. Mm. Cajun animal, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. It yeah. doesn't work, does it? No, it doesn't. And so now, obviously, like I said, you've been sent to the dispersals, which is as serious as it gets in the jail system. There must have been some fear about getting sent to the dispersal system or not really, because it's just. Not really, because I had a lot of friends there. So remember the life that you have to. Let's go back. Let's go back to the past as well with all the activities that I was doing outside, all the friends that I've met, even people that was elder from my community or from other communities that I knew very well, they were all there already. So for me, it was this reuniting with friends that I haven't seen for years. But of course, because I've heard stories. So I knew that, and some of the older guys would say like, now we would really see what you're really about. Because it's a different ball game now. You're dealing with individuals that Let's be honest, some are doing natural life, so they don't hesitate to take your life. You're dealing with other tough established guys that makes what you're doing just seems like a nursery rhyme. It, it's nothing compared to what they, they are tough and hardened guys, no matter what nationality, race, no matter what part of the country that they're from. This is the very best, this is the very tough of the kind of criminal elite. So, of course, it's something that you, it makes you think. So you're naturally a little bit more wary of watching your P's and Q's a little bit more where you've got um, some serious, serious people on the way. Yeah, but I was always, but you know, watching my P's and Q's, I was always a polite person. That was never the issue. I never went to a place and started to like, and people will tell you this, testament, I would never go to a place and start saying, yeah, yeah this is mine, you do this, you do that. I was always, the thing that um, my problem was, is what I said to you earlier. I disliked bullies. And secondly as well, um, I disliked unsavory characters. People just, just felt that, you know, they can behave a certain way and there's no consequences to that. That was my issues. So exactly the same. So um, in this in dispersal, went to dispersal and it was just totally. When I was there, it was like a world wide mess. It was. Some individuals as well, I realise, are um, the type of treatment that they were being subjected to was totally just unacceptable. And that I could not, as, a, as an adult, I could not accept that. Mm. And it just seems like, you know, some men as well, those are so totally broken and so, and so disconnected from the world. Of course. So you're in this environment where there's lots of just people, like I said, that's completely lost and it's just so easy to to follow the path. That's the natural path, isn't it, um, mm -hmm. when you're in there? But um, 
at this point there, you said, I know you said you'd learn how to pray properly at 23. So were you starting to take your faith seriously around these times now you're in dispersal system? Yeah, I was. And I saw the dynamics as well. And it was something that dawned to, it was something that dawned to me as well. When I embraced his mom. And it says that when you take a when you take a life of an individual unjustly, it's like you've taken a life of the whole of humanity. And about justice. And the thing that really upset me and unsettled me as well was that how some people were being treated compared to some. So being bullied, intimidation, the kind of like type of gang activities that was actually happening there. At the time when I used to go to the mosque, especially I started in Whiteman, there was only a few numbers, there weren't many people, but then eventually it grew. But yeah, we stood for something, individuals actually saw this and then they wanted to be a part of that. So one of the things that we wanted to do as well, that let's say that somebody's embraced as long. Now, I believe that it's a responsibility for any civilized society and human being as well is to protect our citizens. And the way that I looked at it as well, that if he wants no more situation or he doesn't want to be a part of what he used to be, then you should allow that man the opportunity to change. Yes. That some people weren't willing or weren't prepared. And even if we spoke to them, you know, sincerely, softly, try to reach a compromise, some people just weren't listening in that way. And so we fought against what we called oppression. Yep. And then that's how, that's how things started. And the more numbers, more Muslims. And then it grew in that sense. And um, what did Islam and your faith give you? Did it give you hope again? 100%. It gave me a peace of mind. Um, peace of mind is obtained by being patient. So definitely, 101%. Obviously, and the love and your brotherhood and sort of family and friendship that... Mm. I was always used to that, and um, but it enhanced that, the extent of it as well. So, for example, it also states that you cannot be a Muslim if your stomach is full at night, but your neighbours go hungry. So it didn't matter what faith or what religion that they are, if your neighbour... And what does your neighbour mean? And this is the amazing thing about Islam as well. Neighbours mean 40 doors to your left, 40 doors to your right. So even if he was outside, that's 40 houses <laughs> to your left, to your right, and in front and behind. So these are the things that kind of drew me. I'm thinking, wow, I saw some amazing things. Once I walked into a brother's cell and he was crying. And he said there was a death. I said, look, I'm so sorry, you know. We say, inna lillahi wa inna alayhi wa So we say, from God we came from and God we will return. But this is the amazing thing. I've never seen this before in my life. He weren't crying because a family member of his died. It was another resident's family member that died. And he was crying for that. These are things that I've never seen before. That selflessness. That type of love. That he didn't really care about himself now. He's just, his focus and his heart is with that brother and their family. And that was amazing for me. I've never seen this. Of course. And so, like I said, it was the, the positive influence of the faith that did, obviously, miraculous things for you while you are in there. Mm. But it was a transition, obviously, having been ingrained with so much badness over the first your teenage years as such. And then it was sort of a transition over the years and the worst environment in the world in order to try and make that transition to positive. Mm. Obviously, many people can't and they have to re sort themselves out when they get out of jail. So what you did was miraculous, but you were still, even though you had such positiveness in your life, you were still sort of fighting the system at the same time. And you have to also remember this as well. Something that the officer said, well, I know that he was in the military and I think he lost some of his um, comrades. And my heart goes out to people that lose their lives. And what's it got to do with me? So, um, he was saying that, you know, I fought for this country and we've got these filthy scumbags. And I'm thinking, wait, have I, I don't know, 
Am I deluded? Am I in prison for something that I don't know what I'm in prison for? Because from my understanding, from what I've been convicted for, I was in for shooting, you know, two gentlemen. There's nothing involving terrorism. So why is this all of a sudden? But it's what they wrote about me. So, you know, I'm a part of this organisation, Muslim Boy Gang. So you took it to real heart. So some of the things that he done, my uncle passed away at the time. So it was kind of a low moment. My uncle passed away. And when I found out the news as well, he was really happy. This um, same officer. They would be singing songs like, oh, what a beautiful morning. Everything's going my way. And things such as that. Um, every time I came out, by then, they eventually took off their helmets and shields. So they would be, I would be on a six-man unlock. But they would still be in a stab-proof um, stab vest and, and so forth. So every time, and remember, he's not connected because I've already put in a complaint. So saying that, look, I don't want anything to es escalate, but I would like this gentleman to leave me alone. And so forth. Because I'm in fear of my safety. And they just totally ignored it. I spoke to IMB, Independent Monitoring Board, and everything. And it just seems, it seems like you're invisible when you're in these types of places. It just seems like it's okay for them. So what actually happened is, on the day of the incident, I was um, coming out to iron my clothing. He quickly came and he wanded me again. But every time he used to use the wand, he always hits me using the kind of excuses to justify his actions. He's trying to antagonize you the whole time. 101%. And that's what he was actually doing. I went into the room and then I heard him. He said, this is our chance to get him. And at the time, I didn't know that it made sense now. Because at first I was thinking, you know, saying, oh, why would he say that? But then through the courts and everything, I observed that there was no cameras. Because it points out in court, I didn't know this. So I said, that's the best time to get him. So now it makes sense in what he said. Um, I'm not saying that I'm proud of him. But then I had that. Obviously, this was another argument as well. You have the iron on the iron board right at the back. The time you walk through, they, they're supposed to close the door. So they're saying that how was I supposed how was I supposed to by then obtain the iron, then come back to the door and then it end up hitting you? It's supposed to be closed the door. So that doesn't make any sense. So I had the iron in my hands and then I lashed out and uh, it connected with him. Oh, and no. it damaged him. And then they pressed the bell. Um, they are um, obviously the officers that were there. Some of them got hurt as well. And then they pressed the bell for second response. The second response came, still trying to, you know, they got their batons out, hit me. And then the third, that means a total lockdown of the whole prison. A third response. And because of the angle, they could only come like two at a time. And unfortunately, so eventually, um, there was a security. There was one of the guys from the security, but he was a he was a really cool guy, and I felt away. So he said that look, and so obviously by then, I surrendered myself, and they took me to one of the rooms. I went into a more controlled, into a more controlled cell. Um, after about two days they were making arrangements because when you're CSC they have to make sure that they move you properly, get all the right people, the amount of officers. They moved me to Full Sutton, Full Sutton Seg. They were very hostile. As soon as I landed there, obviously they're hearing that you've just assaulted an officer. <laughs> One of theirs. Mm. And they were ready to give me a pace. They were, they were absolutely and because and this is the thing as well that was so unfair as well. They knew I had this um, incident with this gentleman. And what do you think? Okay, officers got hurt. But who do you think that when all the reports and everything in the court case came, who they put in the forefront of this? There was a lady officer that was there that got injured. And so at first I was thinking that, did I? Because you don't know, things are happening so fast that you're moving left, right. I'm thinking, did I hit? When I looked at the footage, you see it tripped over the table. I'm not trying to justify it. I'm not trying to justify that. She I'm tripped over the table. She did get deliberately hurt. Right? Mm, I'm saying that first and foremost, this is perjury because you said I hit you. 
and now we know that you didn't, I still got convicted for it. This is what I'm saying about the criminal justice system. Because the judge actually gave them directions, saying that basically, because of um, my actions resulted in the inj um because of my actions, it resulted in the injuries of the officers. This is it, because they'll find it very hard to come back with a decision. But we can still carry on anyway, so they move me to full certain. But I really, I observed one thing. I was struggling like to move. I think it was my, yeah, it was my left. I couldn't raise it up. It was like I was trying. I couldn't. And my breathing. And I said, there's a problem here. When I took off my top and everything, eventually, or they were growling. They said, no, 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 we're not taking responsibility for this. Take him to the x-ray. He needs to get x-rayed. He needs to call the doctor. He's not dying on our watch. Then I looked to myself and I saw it was all black. Yeah. Black as my trousers, my whole ribs. I didn't know because the adrenaline is going, so you're not feeling this. But now I know. So I think um, they said it was fractured. And this is what they've done to me. And yeah, it was... There was difficult times as well, especially when you're in solitary confinement as well, because I don't think it's the isolation that really bothered me, but I think it was the kind of ill treatment that was merited out whilst I was in solitary confinement. And one of the things that I've always remembered was there was a gentleman as well, and he's no friend of ours as any civilized person as well. He was like an EDO, I call him like an EDO, a racist. And so, obviously, they were there as well. And his mother died. So you have compassion. It's still a human being. You have compassion. His mother died. So he just wanted to make a phone call. Now, I know that they are very sticklers to time. So they're basically telling him that, oh, well, you can't make a phone call. At least give some compassion. So he's upset. So I said it should have been a compassionate phone call. So there are these rules and stuff like this. But like we just said a minute ago, the whole thing is designed to punish, antagonize, and then. So what it seems like they're trying to provoke a reaction at certain times to try and get you in worse and worse and worse. It's crazy as that sounds, but I think that's what it feels like. And that's what the whole system seems like it's set out to do. Actually, 1%, because anyway, he kicked his door out of frustration. So the officer came back. I will never forget this. Remember, we can hear what's all going on. It's quiet. It's, it's like an entertainment. I know it's unfortunate, but it is when you haven't got anything. So um, he, said to, he, he said to him that, kick the door one more time and you'll find out. You will definitely find out what's going on. So he done it. And then I will never forget this. The happiness and joy in this officer's face here. Come on, lads, let's suit up. They beat him. When I say that, I've never heard. It was like the cries were inhuman. Fuck. He wet himself, allegedly, because they were laughing about it. He's supposed to be a tough guy, and he wet, he wet himself. And they dragged him. They dragged him out, and because he wasn't um, well endowed, the women were laughing there as well, like wiggling their little fingers and things like this. So like, oh look at So it was just all based on like, you know, humiliation. Humiliation, torture, antagonization. Mm. Suppress, no press and depress, and this is it. And it was so sad as well. And all he wanted to do was just to phone one of his family members. Obviously it's hard. Your mother's your mother's dad. And the most important person to you in the world mm. has actually passed away. So, you know, these were um these were some of the these these were some of the challenges that was actually happening at the time, and it was very it was very very difficult. And it was um so going back to the court cases now. So initially, when the judge received this, so what they said was, I was supposed to go Cambridge, Cambridge Crown Court. They said it's not secure enough for me. There was a rumor that allegedly that I've got some people that might break me out. Then also, the prison guards were escorted by police because they said that they were in fear of their safety, that something would happen to them. So I spoke to my family. I remember having this conversation just briefly, and I said that, look, when the court case starts as well, have more female members 
come up instead of the males. Because I know they're gonna try something about intimidation and everything else as well. I just I just could read the situation already. And lo and behold, what do you think has happened? I said the same thing. I said, Oh, we're being intimidated by Mr. Patterson's family. Fucking hell. But it was so good because the police were in the court and they said, We've not seen nothing. That breaks you in. Mm. And remember, so, so what, women, tiny women and young girls, what, they're going to be intimidated? Like, what's, what's really going on here? So the judge, the judge saw all this and he said, like, what is this? So um, he kind of literally, I remember the first trial, he got disbanded. Threw it out. So what's this? Do you know what the... Do you know what the Crown Prosecution and the Prison Service done? They appealed him. They took to appeal courts. And have you ever heard of this? Prison case, it got appealed. And they took me back to the appeal courts where I had to go central London into the appeal courts. And it got overturned Fuck. by the three judges and said I had to go back to trial. It was all weird. You had guys coming in in suits. I don't know who they were. They were talking to the judge. <laughs> so now um, I'm back where I started again. So I'm back in court. Again, the jury at the time couldn't make a decision. The judge was thinking, what's this? This other judge they put a stay. So now, court cases, now they're saying that I have to have a, a retrial. So now I'm back again for the third time. And then, um, yeah, we were successful in the sense of the office, the officers that got injured the first incident where they were grabbing it, I was found not guilty for that. I was found not guilty for the gentleman that had his throat cut, yeah. but I was found guilty for basically the iron incident with the officer and the female officer as well that got hurt as well. And that really bugged me, but there was a um, there was an area, because I explored this with my barrister as well, that I could have. I could have actually won that case, but I refused to take it. Because I'll tell you why. One thing that I was always taught in life as well is never bite the hand that feeds you. If before dishonor. Never forget the bridge that brought you over. 100%. And there was a woman officer as well. She was very kind. And I knew that by me saying what I was going to say next was going to indicate her. So I said, you know what, I'll just take this loss. And that's what i done. Rather than indicate her. And I know that it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect her. I can't because she's done me right. You're a bigger man for that. And it's, it seems like the, the prison system had really gone to war with you. It seemed like they were trying to do everything they could in order to fuck you. And you ended up spending how long in the CSC? Oh, seven years. Seven years. Fucking absolutely fucking horrific. Mm. So for you to come out sane, everything intact, and even in a better place than when you went in there, it's absolutely remarkable. And I would like to say something that's really unfair as well. And we need to... um. We need to bring light to this as well. There's a gentleman by the name of Chaos. I know you've heard of him as well. Shout out Chaos. Yes. And it's not right what's actually happening to him. He's not had any positive, he's not had an adjudication since 2006. But it's, they're keeping him in SEG and units constantly saying that it's intel. And this is their way of justifying the ill treatment that is being met to him. What, wait, so for 17 wait. years he's been dealing with this? He's been dealing with that, yes. 17 years? 17 years. And from, we're in 2024. And this is... 18? Yeah, fucking hell. This is, this is unjustified. We need to... Please, members of the public as well, if anyone can help us, well, I'm trying to make changes here. I made a promise to a lot of, a lot of these brothers as well that I'll be a voice for them. I understand that you might have a perception about how certain prisons, but it's not the case. I can honestly put my hand on my heart and say, if you give an opportunity to a lot of these individuals as well, you actually see the benefits that they can actually provide for society. Um, 100%. And just to echo that, we need to give people hope. And you're a miracle for getting through it in the way that you did. But 99% of the people, you are the 1%. 99% of the people that go through what you do end up, most of them aren't going to get through it. If they do get through it, they're going to come out a much worse person than what they went in. And so then they're going to do damage to people within society. So it just creates the, 
Abandonments will end up coming back to people within the community who don't deserve it because of how the people have been treated and stigmatised and punished, sort of the beating and the stick sort of thing. It just doesn't work. The society at all. We have to try and start rehabilitating people and shining light on the people that are lost within the system. Do you know what and so hopefully um, we need to get chaos out these CSC. And one of my friend's um, brothers, um, Colin Gunn, he's the longest cat A. Yeah. And, um, um, and we like to have a shout out to Colin Gunn as well. A very nice guy as well. And I'm going to say one thing as well. Whatever the media says about this gentleman here, he is a true gentleman. And I'll tell you the reasons why. And I'll share the story with you. When I came out of um, CSC, eventually, I, it was so warm, the amount of respect and love that was being shown to me. Colin Gunn was one of the first individuals to approach me, and he gave me a big bag of toiletries and food and everything else and said, welcome back. So I have a lot of respect for the Gunn family and so forth. Shout out to Colin. But you know that feeling when you've been actually made it through that a war by getting off the CSC? and being brought back in with your peers and stuff. That must have been the most emotional moment for you. It must have It was. It was it was um it was difficult as well because I left behind lots of great brothers as well that were, you know, great individuals, human beings that were still there as well. And not everyone was coping too well. And there is there is a process as well. Not all of it is I give you an example. After a period of time as well, my my behaviour was what they call exemplary. So they have stages as well. So one of the stages is the pathway out of um CSC. And the path the path the pathway out was in full Sutton. Where that after and it was a, it's a real change because what they're doing is they're preparing you to go back onto the wings. So it's kind of a different approach that they have on, on that unit where that they allow you to mix with others a lot in the whole the whole unit mixes. Yeah. And they've got a kitchen and they've got everything. And so they're preparing you for life back into the dispersal system. And so I was there and it's crazy. The process of coming off the CSC as well is a long process. It took me, once they've agreed that I should come off, it took me about three months to actually come off of. And it was weird because initially they were saying to me as well that, are you, um, okay, what you're going to do is initially you're going to just go for association and then see how you are and then we'll take you from there. I was like, no, I'm just ready to go into the wing. You know, you just want to go into eager. Mm. But I realised their method as well because you don't understand as well that when you've had long, um, long amount of times of solitary confinement as well, it does affect you. And so when everybody came out into the yard, I'll never forget this. It was so touching. So many people came out into the yard just to, you know, hug me, congratulate me, tell me how much. I felt dizzy. It was too much. And that's one of the effects that it had on me, I would say. And then a friend of mine. He identified that and he said that, look, you know, just back up, give him some space. Yeah, so you needed the adjustment back to normality of even the normal prison environment, yeah. which is completely understandable after what you've been through. Mm. You know, you spent seven years on your own. Yeah. Which is... There was moments where you mix, depending on what unit you went to, like, they might have, like, when they assessed your behaviour, for example, they might say that, okay, you can go and exercise with one other person. And so forth. Heard this, yeah. So that does happen, or associate. It depends on what unit and so forth and what unlock management that you're running. But it's solitary confinement, and what tends to happen, they tend to move you between the units and seg. Because remember, when that incident happened, I was in full Sutton. I spent the seg in full Sutton for, I think it was almost a year. And then in Belmarsh, because I had to, I, I went to the court in Woolwich, used the underground passage. Yeah. I spent nearly another year there as well. So you have to understand the, the time. And they were, and they were happy to, um, they were happy to have me. Like Belmarsh was happy to have me on in Belmarsh, but 
the governors at the time was telling me that they were just saying that we don't know what you've done, but the authorities are saying that nope, you have to stay on CSC. So nothing worth it. And so the point where you end up getting off the CSC after seven years, mm. what year was this then roughly? So this was yeah, so I went in in two thousand and two thousand and ten. 2010, yeah, 2017. And just the, the, starting the beginning, so I'm just slightly, just slightly under seven years because I came out in um 2016 December. In December, yeah. Yeah, so just slightly under seven years. Mm. And that's it. Fucking insane. Like I said, you're a miracle if I had made it through that. And like no, I'm saying, you've you bear witness to the people that haven't and the people that have lost the plot and the amount of people that have been nutted off from this thing that they're trying to make nut off from. from that's their 100, goal. one percent. And it's tragic. So, um, mm. yeah, thoughts are with the other people still in no, those conditions. You. Because it's as difficult well. as well. It's like a game of snakes and ladders. As you know already, they roll the dice. You go up a few steps, but then you go all the way back down to the bottom again. And that's how that system is. It's designed to make you that way. So we also need to understand that. And there was an experiment being made as well. So we know this. they done it with less sophisticated species than what we are as human beings. Our minds are very complex. So imagine this, They've, they, they had an experiment with two uh, mice. So what they done was they emerged one in total blackness. They, they wrapped it up and it was in total darkness. And they wrapped the other one in total darkness, but they left a little hole. So they know that the light was shining through that hole. So they both emerged, both of the my, mice in the jars where that they were the mouses where that the water was emerged to a certain height so the mouses was treading water now what they found was they left them until the following morning when they came back to their amazement as well the one that was in total darkness drowned but the one that was treading water carried on treading water and what does that show they, what they basically said was that the one that was still treading water, it saw, it saw the light, so it was a glimmer of hope for him. So that hope kept him motivated in order for him to, you know, always having that hope that there's an opportunity that he may survive this, where the other one that was emerged in darkness just gave up. And that's what a lot of my brothers are doing right now in Solitary Confinement. They're giving up. Of course, because there is no hopes. So there isn't that little light shining through. So the little light shining through, you have to create that hope yourself because there is no light. And so you found that, whether it be family support, friend support, and through your faith. Because I never knew this as well. There was an officer who was very, sorry to say this, as a human being, very despicable. And he said to me as well that we're going to break you. And I initially thought that what he meant by when he said he was going to break me, was going to physically break me, but it was not that. They were saying that mentally retarded. And what I mean by mentally retarded was, was to go back into the community and just be angry. And that's what he, um, basically, that's what he wanted to achieve. And we call this, we call this the Jean Valjean syndrome. So if you know the book Les Miserables as well, and Jean Valjean was a man that he tried to protect, he tried to protect his sister and his, you know, niece and nephews from starvation. So what did they do? What did he do? He smashed he smashed a shop glass window and took some bread in order to feed his family. But doing this, he was incarcerated for what five years? Five to seven years? And all this time he couldn't accept him being incarcer in, in incarceration. So he kept on fighting against the system, trying to escape. And he had more time piled on until he ended up doing 19 years of incarceration. When he was released, he was Obviously, he was upset, but he still had hope. But in France at that time as well, they give you like a green card. And so they knew that he was a convict. So what did they do? They, they stereotyped against him. So what did he say? He said, well, if you're going to treat me like a monster, I'm going to behave like a monster. So he became a monster. And so this is what we call the Jean Valjean syndrome. Of course. This is, what, this is the problem with the whole prison system being a punishment rather than rehabilitation. You've put people back into society that were worse than when they went in. 100%. And so you, it's not, it's, 
it's the, the general members of the public as well. They think that, okay, we just want to punish them, but it's going to be general members of the public who are going to suffer at the hands of these people mm. that have been hurt and punished unjustly. Obviously, yes, we believe there's some sort of punishment. Just being locked away from your family and loved ones is enough punishment. Let's try and rehabilitate these people now and cure these people. And trying to address the traumas, mainly because I believe that I'd say more than 90% of um, adult offending comes down to childhood trauma or adult trauma. Yeah. And then if it doesn't get addressed in the right way, then it ends up, the mind finds the wrong ways to deal with situations. No, and um, but like I said, like, it's, it's an absolute miracle. It's like the office admitted they were trying to break you, that you got through that time in there. And I'm sure they were reluctant to. It was only through you that got yourself out of there. So after sense. seven years, you managed to get back onto the wings, which is amazing. Yeah. And so then you've ended up... So, yeah, so what they done was, um, as soon as I got onto the wing, obviously I came with, by their words, that with a big reputation. So the um the CEO, the CM of the time, they called me into the office and he said, um, she said, look, you know that times have changed. You know, we have a lot of like young officers as well. Mm. And they can be sometimes a bit immature. You know, old school, you're old school as well. We understand that. So look, if if any of them does anything that kind of offends you as well, please come to us first. And I just said to her, look, who do you respect as well? I have no intentions of causing any kind of disruption within your, within your prison. I just want to be left alone so that I can actually progress. Yes. So um, that's what I literally done. And then from that, I, you know, reaped the rewards in the sense of I became wing representative. I then became a prisoner council member, which gave me access to the governors. Where I sat down with the governors and just and actually articulated what my the rest of my fellow residents want or what they felt was unfair for them. Fair play, it's incredible for you to do that. And congratulations. And it seemed like the system, there must have been some sort of good people in the system at that point there, mm -hmm. in the system to allow you to do that. Because obviously before they've been completely opposed and fighting against mm. you and trying to antagonise you. 100%. So there are some good people within the system at the same time. We can't forget yes. this. 100%. Um, without them, maybe none of us get through or you don't get through and others don't get through. That's correct, yes. So then obviously, um, over those five years then, from you getting put back on the wing to getting released, did you manage to get through without any violent incidents or major incidents? Yeah, there was no more violent incidences. Which is incredible because, because in that um, environment, which people don't understand, sorry to interject, mm, it's... Um, the problem is with these people on the life licenses, the IPPs and stuff like this, it's so, so difficult to get through a 12-month period or an 18-month period without doing something. And they might say, oh, well, without doing something violent, you can't go 12 months. But this is, you don't understand the environment you're in with caged animals, which they turn humans into caged animals. And people will try, and even the inmates will try and antagonise you. They will do stuff to you. Yeah. You might feel it in threat of yourself. There's lots of people with such severe mental health problems. You end up having to... So you've just got to... What's remarkable is having to turn the, the, the shoulder and ignore stuff, which I'm sure you've done over the years. And yeah, you've shown a lot of compassion to a lot of people in order to not be violent. 100%. In order to get through that. 100%. And so did you end up obviously working your way down? Did they end up getting you all the way to DCAT or anything like this before? Yeah, so what actually happened is, so from um, Full Sutton, I was then, I was then taken to... Dove, Dove Gate. So this was initially the therapeutic, therapeutic yeah. side. Um, again, is that kind of ethos of breaking you down and building you back up again? I just felt that. I think there was a few factors that was very difficult for me there. One was because of um so-called reputation that I actually had as well, and because they had especially my paperwork as well, very manipulative. I suffer with glib, you know, words come easily, but it's insincere. Um, I've got psychopathic tendencies. You know, all these kind of what I believe was a misrepresent misrepresentation of who I am as an individual. I just felt that they will always seem to be on edge. So eventually, 
I always remember there was one scene especially where the psychologists, and this is why that these things need to be explored as well, that people that are in a position of authority need to be held accountable. Of course. There was this psychologist and they were having a meeting and she said, um, Mr. Patson, I believe that you're being insincere. So I asked, I said, with all due respect as well, you're entitled to your opinion, but you have to understand that your opinion will affect, you know, will affect my, my progression. So I would like to ask you a question as well. Why do you deem this? She said this, because people like you don't talk like that. I must admit, even her colleagues turned to her and said, what do you mean by this? So these are the kind of like, you know, preconceived ideas that individuals actually have. And these are the, sometimes the challenges that one is actually facing as well. Of course. And um, obviously she was obviously looking things in the complete wrong way and very discriminatory. Mm. And then obviously, but obviously I had preconceived ideas of you. Obviously I'd heard about you yeah. over the last few years. And That's obviously true. I fully admit this. And obviously I'm hearing about this ferocious character. You'd create this reputation between the age of 18 and 20. And obviously you're a completely changed man. But I'd obviously only heard of this. And mm. so then... When I heard you come out and be so articulate and so well spoken and beautiful use of vocabulary, even sort of like a poet in certain ways, it was um, most unexpected for me at the same time. So um, but she was obviously Thank you. I fully embraced it and believed it, obviously, but she mm. was the other way. No, definitely. And I always say this as well that proof is in the pudding. You know, allow me that opportunity and I'll prove to you and so forth. But things never really worked out because at that time as well, I then met my beautiful wife. Fantastic. So at that time as well, I came out of, um, as you know already, solitary confinement, and I felt kind of like there was an inner peace, but there was a loneliness as well. And where that sometimes you would know as well that when you're in a high level of male, testosterone-driven environment, you sometimes need that feminine touch. Oh, it's crave. Obviously, I'm sure you must have more say you have to so, so yeah, many years. I, I spoke to my family. It's just like, you know, I asked them, like my brothers and everybody else, do you know anyone that I can at least just have a conversation with? And then, you know, my wife, she's very open minded to the, you know, to the process of this. And we spoke. And then we fell in love with each other. Congratulations, both of you. No, no, thank you very much. You deserved some love and something good after all the no, years of pain and strife that you've been through. But it was just very difficult for her as well because the best is still to come and all the trials and tribulations and I have to thank her as well for look, the reasons why I mention her so much and people say that, well what about your parents? And hundred and one percent but your parents are your parents. <laughs> you know this, your mother, your father and so forth, but this is a this is a lady that felt that she had a connection with me. But then what got told to her and everything else that was happening, that would push most people, 99.9% .9 of people away from you. Whoa. You know, she had her own challenges. You know, people telling her that, are you stupid? Are you insane? Do you know what type of person that you're going to be connected with? And so forth. But she believed, she believed in us, our love story. Because that's what it is. It's our love story. Of course. So it was um it was very challenging times and you know, she she done so much for me. And I could never repay her. And you know, she's just amazing. And she's actually home to me in, you know, coping with this new world. Because it is this totally new world. But before we go back to that. So yeah. So eventually, um what was so sad is well, they said that I weren't compatible for their program. So I thought that because I haven't done anything. That would be an easy transition. And what the transition would actually be as well was me just to go to um, the other side. So what they call the, the main side. So not the therapeutic now, just go over to Dovegate itself. Yeah. They're saying that we can't do this. You need to go to um, the senders, to the prison that sent, yeah. sent you. But it was very strange though, because I know after a period of time as well, that they can just cross you over too. But they didn't want to do it for me. But what I never knew at the time, they were having conflict with Full Sutton. They said to the governor, we're bringing Patterson back. The governor said, we don't want Mr. Patterson back. Why should we take him back? Has he done anything? Has he injured the officer? Has he done? Do you know how long this man has done of incarceration? Do you know what he's been through? Fair play to them. So I have to. No, seriously. I have to give it to Full Sutton. 
and they were saying like um they were saying that no so for, for, for certain saying that we're not taking him now what they done was one day my door opened and i had many officers around i think what have i done because remember my schemes are coming back now <laughs> i'm thinking what about they say you need to pack we're helping you pack to start throwing my things into bags so eventually they drove all the way to yorkshire jumped in the van all the way to yorkshire and they waited outside the gates with me there eventually they let them in and i went through the process what they slightly done was full sutton refused to have me but they know by putting me on the van and driving me all the way to the gates now full sutton has to accept me it's absolute madness isn't it that system fights each other within the systems got crazy so what full sutton said was after the governor said don't unpack I'm sending you back. Back to Hyundai. Yeah, that's what he said. Don't unpack, I'm sending you back. Because you don't deserve this. Fair play to him, he was a human. So, um, what happened was after about six weeks, and that's the quickest, you know that in dispersal was like, it doesn't work like that. I've been years in there. So you now had people fighting your case within the system, which is <laughs> brilliant. This is correct, because they've, they've actually seen it for themselves, that I'm sincere in this. It's been years. You proved it with the test of time. I'm just... On, just to get words with my actions now. 101%. So they, they sent me back. And then from Dovegate, um, I went on to a wing, which they called at the time E-Wing, which they called the Bronx, where they said that even some officers were crying not to go in there. Ended up bursting in tears. I'm thinking, why is this? Mm. When I went onto the wing, all it was was that it was just a lot of guys that wanted to have fun. It was like a fun environment in that sense. It's not really my cup of tea because I don't really engage in certain things, but I can understand that they're making the, the best of a worse situation. I've, I've seen so it. It might have been a bad thing for you at that time. So I've met, and I've been in there, and I've been on those wings, and I've wanted to be on those wings. Mm. Because when you're doing a relatively small sentence, you just want to have fun, you want to go crazy, you want to. It's obviously very immature, but then when I've, my other friends who are doing much more serious sentences, like, well, right, come on, that's the last place I want to go, you know? 101%. So they were, you know, it, it was, it was, you know, I wouldn't, it was like tongue in cheek. Mm. It, it, it wasn't like what they were, mm. but then again, it, it just seems like, so I had all the jobs. So they gave me, um, I was a healthcare orderly, but what my job also entailed as well was actually engaging with those guys that had the, um, the mental health issues mm. and mm. playing games with them, talking to them. That's the position that they gave me, which was That'd very brilliant. Good. I was a wing representative. Um, I was also a violence reduction rep, and I was also a listener. I had so many jobs that I had to give it back to them. I said, I can't do all this. No, this of course, too it's too much. It's overwhelm you and it's spread you too thin. They're trying to get mm. you to do every job. And so they were asking me, but then um, eventually I relinquished um, my position on violence reduction rep because if you look at the concept of violence reduction as well, it was like you're the mediator between like sometimes gang disputes young men that are kind of angry with the system and also officers as well that officers could do a wrong thing as well and you're the kind of like mediator but i didn't like what they were doing they were kind of using that as a platform like what do you think we're going to be a spy for you or something like that so i said that look that's not what i'm about i don't i don't represent that so i said you can take your job back after that it seems like they had a problem because then there was accusations that, oh, um, maybe I am, I've got a lot of influence. Um, you know, the, the whole oh, history, yeah, yeah. So no the history started to repeat itself again. Mm. So it was, it was very difficult, but I, I had patience. And then eventually I thought that, okay, I've gone over my tariff for such a long time. Maybe I can apply for a DCAT. I wasn't asking for a release. I was asking for a DCAT. Yeah. So when my parole time came, and you have to also take into consideration that I've been knocked back from from 10 parole hearings. Fucking insanity. So I was um I was hoping to, you know, I've proven myself, I've proven my worth to get a DCAT. I said no. Still no. So eventually, anyway, they gave me a um I got a CCAT. I went to Brixton, the LPU unit. Which was which was um London Parkway, you know, which was okay. The officers, the officers were good. The psychologist was good. 
but for some reason the security team they had a fixation on it so they made it very very difficult they will anytime i got any books or anything sent in it had to go to security first and uh, like i wouldn't get it for about six or seven weeks and i had so much intel and then the biggest thing happened i couldn't believe it there was intel that i was um planning to cause an atrocity in the streets of britain how i had underground cells how i've got a phone they search me no word of a lie nearly every month every month every two weeks i was getting a cell search um it got it got horrific in that sense it was just like it was very difficult like even even the officers that were on the on the wing at the time and the psychologists were saying mr patterson ain't doing anything it's a small it's a small unit we can hear everything that they're saying it's tiny you know so there's there's no there's no area that he could actually hide away and they were saying that keep your mouth shut and do your job basically so this was um this was going on so then the big shock that i had and my wife's a testament to this as well and all those legal teams that had involvements with me as well I went to a pro here. They had a specialist judge there that specializes in like Islam. He asked me so many different questions. He was very well scored in Islam. Okay. Then, uh, no word of a lie, I spent less than five minutes talking about my index offense. Everything else was related on terrorism, Islam, what my views are, what my views are on this, what my views are on that which was very alarming for me, very demoralizing for me. Then they asked me halfway through to leave on parole here. I had to leave because they're saying that it's information that cannot be disclosed to me, which they have. So then they, um, my barrister said to me at the time, she says, do you trust me? I said, of course I do. So she said, I will represent you. No, I would represent you to the best. She had to sign a form as well that was liable to him um, for her imprisonment if it ever leaked out or whatever kind of information that they had on me. It was absolutely, it was absolutely um, crazy. Um, I didn't know. It was like touching guards. Okay, am I going to get it? Then I was given the glad tidings that I got my deed, my open conditions. But it went the end of the matter. Because as soon as the day before I was supposed to be leaving, I got another spin. My security they never found anything. They never found anything. It's trying to fuck you at the last moment. I went to DCAT and it was relaxed. I never had a I never had a problem with anybody. Um officers, they were all relaxed. But then all of a sudden is that they said, Oh, we have a um we have somebody to see. I said, okay, who? You know, you just want to know. I said, who? What, probation, whatever. They said, yeah, you'll find out. I went there. A young lady presented herself and she said, yeah, I'm from um, National Security Division. You will now be working with us, not with probation anymore. So they were managing me. We're going to be managing you. And I was very shocked by this. And I'm thinking, what? But this is like terrorist cases. Like, I'm not like, they had me on some high level. So I'm thinking, like, what's really, like, you know, what's really going on? So with that came, um, they restricted me in many ways. So, for example, as well, you know, usually in open conditions as well, you look forward to just, you look forward to, like, going home, home leaves and things like that. I couldn't do this. I had to go to an AP, but even with the AP, I had to report every two hours. Mm. And every time I report back, I have to stay for an hour or Oh, then two hours and then go out for just two hours and so forth. I was on GPS tag and even when I was released as well. Fair play to you for obviously going through and jumping through all these hurdles, even at that point where you should eventually get your freedom, you got to fight for every step of it the whole way. And so how long did you end up in DCAP then before you unbelievably actually just got two released? Years. Just two years. Two years? Yeah, Fucking two else. years. But well, I suppose you've done fucking 20 and a half years 100%. prior to that. But what I'd like to say as well, because we move forward now, so I'm out, I'm released now. I'm trying to have an opportunity of just living my life and trying to find occupation as well. And 
no way will touch me because I was still with national security at the time. I'm no, no longer with them or got GPS tag and so forth. But I was just getting, I'll go to a job interview. They'll say that, yeah, you fit the criteria. But then after they're saying that, but, you know, we um, we found somebody else and you've got, you haven't got enough experience and so forth. So I had many challenges until I stumbled across Grapple Zone. And so we have to give them a big shout out as well, especially Coach Timor, Coach Sophia and Coach Courtney as well that gave me that opportunity. They actually believed in rehabilitation. And I would like to congratulate them. Big props that. to them, never on that. No, no, definitely. And thank you for that. And um, since you've been out, obviously, the last 14 months, um, how hard has it been, the adjustment period, and how important has it been for your wife to support you through that um, period mm. after spending 22 and a half years behind bars, and obviously the five pre previously. So for a relatively young man, you'd spent 27 and a half years, you spent more time behind bars than you spent freedom. Yeah, so the readjustment can be very frightening as well. Because one thing that I've, one thing that I've actually, um, when you're in prison as well, you kind of conjure up this romantic notion of how the world is going to be. But <clears throat> as soon as you, I call it, as soon as you're back to the land of the living, you realize that it's not as what you perceived it to be. So it's that kind of like, um, re, it's like that kind of readjustment. So yeah, it's been, it's had its challenges as well. The world has actually changed and dramatically as well. The thing that I found the most was is that how disconnected people were. And I called it like a zombie apocalypse. Of course. And even in regards to, you know, how people perceive things. And sometimes I even looked at certain, even when I'm, you know, working at Grapple Zone and so forth, and I'm talking to customers and how they behave and how they react as well. And I say to myself that if they were ever in my situation, they would never be released because of the lack of patience that they actually have and that the way that they respond to certain situations. Of course, of course. Um, like I said, it's um, absolutely miraculous what you've been through. And I know some of it was brought upon yourself by doing many acts of violence, but the punishment and the rib was way too much and it was just absolutely ridiculous and unjust. Mm -hmm. So you are a miracle to be where you are today, in the mindset you are today. Um, there must be a message that you want to share with people. Obviously, you shared it over the last three hours, but mm. there must be a message maybe you want to share or a shout-out you want to give to the people who are still inside in those conditions, whether it be chaos or... No, definitely. I would, I would actually like to say as well that, again, as what I've always said, the world is a teacher to the wise man and the enemy to the fool. And I would always like to say to individuals as well that it's not for me to tell you how you should live your life. But it's what my father always taught me as well, and my mother. It's not the mistakes that you have to worry about, but it's the consequences that come with the mistakes. See, one thing that I was always taught as well is that a liar is a murderer. Because when you lie, you murder the truth. That hinders and impedes justice. When you hinder and impedes justice, you destroy the social order, which then makes you very unpleasant person so i would actually say to us as well like let's try let's get together and let's create a better society and especially in my community as well so i just want to be given this opportunity as well and anybody listening as well that come and let's there are people that really need our help and let's build something right now we have other opportunities as well like for example as well what i have been doing as well i'm going to work alongside my cousin which she has a, a business called um, Assistant Support Hub, which hopefully we just need to, you know, fund in and everything else as well. Then we have our other, have a, a, another cousin as well, that they, they have an organization called JAMS, which is jokes, arts, and music. And yeah, this is it. And would like to collaborate something and please if anybody's interested indeed well, i'm sure a lot of people will be reaching out and guys i'm going to attach Dwayne's instagram below in the description box so please reach out to him and support him in any way you can but um 
But again, I'd like to echo what I said at the start and thank you again for the opportunity. And I'd like to commend you as well for getting out with the mindset that you've got today and not being in the nut house in Broadmoor or something like this, which is what they tried to do to you. Um, I really look forward to watching your progression, your freedom and everything you've done. And like I said, it's long overdue and I'm sure you're going to do great things out here. Um, and I look forward to getting you back on the channel as well at oh, some point whenever yeah. you want it's open to you and get you on as much as possible and if there's any any way that I can help you moving yeah, forward you. please let me know and um, I'm definitely going to try and introduce you to some people that can that benefit from you and you benefit from them at the same time so um, thank you very much congratulations well done and uh, yeah people reach out to him support him and like share and subscribe and thank you for watching up until this point so thank you very much, Dwayne. It's been a, a pleasure. Great to meet you. Thank you very much as well.